Hello everyone and welcome to our very first chapter of the semester. Chapter one is entitled An Invisible World. Because this is our first chapter of the semester, I want to remind you to have a piece of paper handy or a Word document open so that you can answer the checkpoint questions as they come up and record those answers that you will then turn in on Blackboard once you're finished with the lecture. So chapter one is designed to introduce you to the world of microbiology. We're going to be talking about what microbiology is, the organisms that it studies, and we're also going to review a brief history of the developments in the field of microbiology leading up to today. So if you're in this course, you probably have some idea of what microbiology means, just based upon the structure of the word itself. You probably know that biology is the science that studies living organisms, and that the prefix micro means extremely small. Hence, microbiology is the science that studies microorganisms, or in other words, microbes, which are extremely small living things that usually cannot be seen with the unaided eye. One of the things that we want to impress upon you right from the very beginning is that just because microbiology studies small things does not mean that this is a limited sort of science. And in fact, the types of organisms that are studied in microbiology are extremely diverse. Microscopic organisms can have a wide variety of characteristics. They can be unicellular, meaning composed of a single cell, or they can be multicellular, meaning composed of multiple cells within the same organism. They can also be either prokaryotic or eukaryotic. If these terms sound familiar, it's probably from a prerequisite course that you took where you learned that the two major classes of cells in biology are the prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. Prokaryotic cells are defined as ones that lack a nucleus and any other internal membrane-bound organelles. They are smaller and simpler than their counterparts, eukaryotic cells, which possess a nucleus, are larger, and have many uh, membrane-bound organelles, some of which we'll touch upon in a later lecture. Microorganisms can also either be heterotrophs or autotrophs. This has to do with how they obtain their energy. Heterotrophs are organisms that obtain their energy through exterior chemical sources, so for example, through eating. Autotrophs are organisms that obtain their energy from sunlight. Microbes can be either. Microbes can also be life-sustaining or life-threatening. And this is also sometimes a misconception that people have about microscopic organisms, that all of them are infectious, all of them are pathogenic and dangerous, and that is not true, because many microbes are absolutely essential for life as we know it, and we'll talk more about these microbes later on in the course as well. Microbes can also be extremely diverse in terms of their size. So just because something is small doesn't mean that everything is equally small. And in fact, microbes have very different sizes, and this microbe scaling chart gives us a picture of those different sizes. At the top of the chart, we can see the largest types of microbes. Um, in the very first line, we see a period character, the punctuation mark in 12 point size font, which is 500 micrometers, or in other words, half a millimeter in diameter. Among the largest microbes include protists, such as amoeba, paramecia, diatoms, and others. And as we can see, these largest microbes are somewhere close to, but not quite the same size as a period punctuation mark. The protist amoeba is 300 micrometers in diameter, which compares to the 500 micrometers of the period punctuation mark. Paramecia are 250, so they're, they're half as big as the period punctuation mark. But then we get down to things like bacteria. So bacteria are different from protists. This is a different category of micro, which we'll talk about later. Escherichia coli, or E. coli, is only two micrometers in diameter. So whereas a paramecium is half the size of a period punctuation mark, an E. coli bacterium is 250 times smaller than a period punctuation mark. But we can get even smaller, too. Once we get down through bacteria, we get to even smaller microbes, such as viruses. 
Viruses, among the smallest viruses, include, uh, let's see, poliovirus, and we've got the rhinovirus. Rhinovirus is one of the most common causes of the upper respiratory infection we know as the common cold. And this is, we're, we're in the decimal places now, we're in 0 0.03 micrometers in diameter. So this is many, many hundreds of times smaller than the largest microbes, the protists, that we saw on the previous slide. What this means is that smaller microbes often can fit inside of larger microbes, and they can often fit in large numbers. For example, hundreds of thousands of viruses can fit inside of a bacterium, and often hundreds of bacteria could fit inside of a protist. So just because something is small doesn't mean that everything is equally small. We're talking about a very wide range, a very wide diversity of microbes when we are studying microbiology. Now, with all those microbes out there in the world, there has to be a system for being able to recognize them, identify them, and name them so that they can all be kept straight. And this system that we used is called taxonomy. Taxonomy is a system for classifying living organisms, starting with broad categories and putting them in increasingly specific categories until you arrive at a specific name of the organism. This taxonomic system is used not just for microbes, but for all living organisms. And let's look at the example of humans just to see how it works. At the broadest level, humans are classified into the kingdom called Animalia, because we are animals. Phylum is chordata, meaning that we are animals that have backbones and spines. Our class is mammalia, meaning that we are animals with backbones and spines that are mammals. Our order is primates. Our family is hominidae. And the genus and species, this is where we really get to the name of the organism. When we name and identify an organism, these two words are the ones that are used to designate it. For example, humans belong to the genus Homo and the species Sapiens. So humans are called Homo sapiens. So when we name microbes, we adhere to this very same convention. We name the microbe first with its first name, the genus, and with its second name, species. When we do this, both of these words should be italicized, and the genus should be capitalized, but not the species. So let's take a look at some examples of microbes that are named with this convention. First, we have Escherichia coli, which we saw before on the scaling chart. Escherichia coli is named after the German bacteriologist Theodor Escherich, and it's also named after the colon, which is the part of the body where it typically resides. So oftentimes, we can find clues in the names of the microbes as to where they live, what their function is, who discovered them, things like that. We also see that the names of microbes can be abbreviated. So when you hear the word E. coli, that is the abbreviated name for Escherichia coli. It is conventional to abbreviate the first word, the genus, with just the first letter followed by a period, and to write the species name out in its entirety. Another example of a name of a microscopic organism is Saccharomyces cerevisiae, abbreviated to S. cerevisiae. Saccharomyces cerevisiae is named for the fact that this is a fungus, specifically a yeast. Myces means fungus. Saccharo means sugar. And cerevisiae is named for the fact that this is used to make beer. Cerveza is a cognate to the Spanish word cerveza, and this name literally means a sugar-eating fungus that brews beer. This is the yeast that is made to brew beer. Salmonella enterica, abbreviated S. enterica, is named for Daniel Salmon, who discovered it, and enterica is a play on the word entero, uh, entero is used to describe bacteria that are found in the intestines. So these are just a few examples. And when it comes to our very first checkpoint of this lecture, 
what I want you to do here is tell me what is wrong with the way the name is written of this microscopic organism. Vibrio cholerae, the bacterium that causes the digestive disease cholera, tell me everything that's wrong with the way that it's written. So once you've written down your answer for this checkpoint, we're going to move on. If you need more time, feel free to pause the lecture. But next we are going to take a look at the different types and categories of microbes that are found within the purview of our course here. We have six categories of microbes that we are going to be studying, and those include bacteria, archaea, fungi, protists, viruses, and helminths. So before we get started looking into the characteristics of each of these different types of microscopic organisms, I want you to brainstorm and think of one reason why you believe it is important for us to study these different types of microbes. Why do you think it's important to learn about these different categories? Give me one reason. Again, feel free to pause the lecture at this point and continue when you're ready. So now let's get started going through these six categories of microbes and talking about their characteristics. We'll start with bacteria. Bacteria are a unicellular microscopic organism meaning they are always composed of just a single cell. There are no multicellular bacteria. They are also prokaryotic, meaning that they are composed of those smaller, simpler, nucleus-lacking type of cells, which we contrast to eukaryotic cells. Bacteria reproduce asexually through a process called binary fission. When they produce offspring, they do not combine their genetic material with another partner bacteria, as is done in sexually reproducing organisms. Instead, they simply clone themselves and split in two, which splitting in two is literally what the words binary fission means. Binary means two, fission means to split. They split in two. Bacteria have cell walls which are layers that lie external to the cell membrane and are responsible for protecting the bacteria. And these cell walls are composed of a substance called peptidoglycan. Peptidoglycan is an important substance that we'll be talking a lot more about in future lectures, and it turns out to be important as a way to identify different types of bacteria as well as a target for treating certain types of bacterial infections. Bacteria may be heterotrophic or autotrophic. So there are some species of bacteria that eat in much the same way that we do by consuming chemical compounds in their environment and breaking them down to produce energy. And there are other bacteria that are able to capture the energy of sunlight and use that to drive their metabolic processes. Many bacteria are motile, meaning they're capable of moving throughout their environment. And many of them do so by swimming through the use of a appendage called a flagellum. Plural form of that word is flagella. And you can see a example of a flagellum sticking off the back of this bacterial cell shown here. There are three different shapes that bacteria are generally found in. Those three shapes are important because they are often the first step for identifying an unknown bacteria. The first shape is called coccus. These cells are spherical or ovoid in shape. The plural of this word is cocci, C-O-C-C-I. The second shape is bacillus, the plural of which is bacilli, B-A-C-I-L-L-I. These ones are rod-like in shape. And the third shape is spiral. These ones have a corkscrew-like shape. So that completes our brief introduction to bacteria.
Next, we're going to take a look at our second category of microbes, which are called archaea. Archaea, like bacteria, are unicellular and prokaryotic. In fact, bacteria and archaea are the only two categories of microbes that are both unicellular and prokaryotic. And another thing that they share in common with bacteria is that they reproduce through this asexual cloning process called binary fission. Where they diverge from bacteria, however, is that their cell walls do not contain peptidoglycan. They are composed of a different substance that is similar to the structure of peptidoglycan, but is not identical, and so it is called pseudopeptidoglycan. Archaea are known for living in a very wide variety of environments and especially like to live in extreme environments. They are considered extremophiles in many cases, meaning organisms that prefer to live in extreme environments in terms of temperature, acidity, and other qualities. For the most part, archaea are not known to be involved in human diseases, and this also sets them apart from bacteria, many of which are pathogenic to humans and animals. Archaea, however, are, for the most part, as I said, not known to be involved in human diseases. However, I will point you to two emerging examples that have been discovered in the past few years where archaeal species may be involved. Another interesting fact about archaea is that these organisms are more closely related to multi multicellular life, such as animals and humans, than bacteria are. These particular species, Blochiarchaeum, are found to be the most closely related prokaryotic organism to the part of the tree of life upon which humans reside. And there's an article in the slides that is linked right here where you can read more about this species. Archaea are generally divided into three different categories. Methanogens are archaea that produce methane as a waste product. Halophiles are salt-loving archaea, which like to live in extremely salty places. And when we say salty, we don't just mean salty like the ocean, we mean much, much saltier, something with a very high percentage of salt content, such as, for example, the Great Salt Lake in Utah. Thermophiles, the third category, are heat-loving archaea. These like to live in very hot water, and typically water that is naturally sulfurous, such as that found in geysers and hot springs. Now, as I said, archaea are for the most part, not known to be involved in human diseases. However, there have been some recent discoveries that methanogens seem to be involved in certain disease processes, particularly IBS, or irritable bowel syndrome, as well as in periodontal disease. So this research is still ongoing, but this is sort of the first evidence that has emerged that archaea might be involved in human diseases. The third category of microbe that we'll be looking at in this class are the fungi. Fungi can be either unicellular or multicellular. They are also eukaryotic, not prokaryotic, meaning that they are larger, they contain a nucleus and other membrane-bound organelles. Fungi are diverse in terms of their ability to reproduce because they can reproduce asexually or sexually sometimes within the same organism. They possess cell walls, but their cell walls are not composed of peptidoglycan or pseudopeptidoglycan. They are composed of a substance called chitin, which is different in structure from peptidoglycan or pseudopeptidoglycan. They are heterotrophic, meaning that they need to eat in order to drive their metabolic processes. They cannot perform photosynthesis, which is sometimes a misconception about fungi. They are not like plants, and in fact, fungi are more closely related genetically to animals than they are to plants. The examples of the categories of fungi that we will be looking at in this class are the molds and the yeasts. 
Obviously not all fungi are microscopic because there are lots of fungi um, that we can see with our naked eye, including mushrooms, for example. But we are only going to concern ourselves with molds, such as the bread mold that you see right here, and yeasts, which are unicellular microscopic fungi. Next, we have the protists. The protists are unicellular and they are eukaryotic. The protists are a very diverse category. And this category historically has essentially included any single celled eukaryotic organisms that do not fit into other categories of microbes. So, in this sense, the protists are sort of a catch all category. The protists can roughly be divided into two different subcategories, which include algae and protozoa. However, in this course, we are not going to be studying algae, and instead, we are going to be focusing on protozoa. And the reason why that is the case is because our class has a particular slant to focus on clinical microbiology. Algae are not involved in disease processes. Protozoa, however, can be. Protozoa are the category of protists that literally means minute animals. So these types of protists lack a cell wall. They can reproduce sexually or asexually. They can be free living, but there are also many species of parasitic protists, some of which have humans as their hosts. They can also be heterotrophic or autotrophic. And this means that some protozoa do consume substances in their environment as food sources. Some use the energy of sunlight in order to live. So as we can see, we have an extremely diverse category of microbes. There aren't a whole lot of characteristics that unify the protists, except for their being unicellular and eukaryotic. On the screen right here, we can see two examples of protists. One of them is the amoeba, which you may have heard of before. This is a protist or a protozoa specifically that uh, is usually free living but can sometimes be parasitic. The one at the top is Plasmodium falciparum, and you can see the sample of red blood cells here, one of which is infected with these fuchsia colored Plasmodium falciparum cells. This is the protozoan parasite that causes the infectious disease malaria. We'll talk more about that later. This brings us to the viruses. Viruses are a little bit different from other categories of microbes because they are not actually composed of cells at all. They are extremely small, even on the scale of microbes. As we saw on our scaling chart, the smallest microbes were the viruses. They're not made of cells, so they are neither prokaryotic nor eukaryotic, and they are often pathogenic. Viruses must infect a living cell, either prokaryotic or eukaryotic, in order to reproduce more viruses. And this means that viruses are not really considered to be alive by biologists. The reason why this is the case is because they cannot reproduce without the assistance of a living cell that they use as their host. You may have learned in a previous course that there are certain characteristics that living organisms possess which define them as living organisms, such as the ability to grow, the ability to maintain homeostasis, and the ability to reproduce, among others. Because viruses cannot reproduce on their own, they are not considered alive. The structure of a virus not being composed of cells is very simple. They are composed of genetic material, which can either be DNA or its cousin molecule, RNA, which is surrounded by a protein capsid. What you see on the screen here is an image of the human papillomavirus, or HPV. And what you see here is the protein capsid. Internal to this capsid would be its genetic material. 
This image here was taken using an electron microscope, which is a much more precise and highly resolved microscope compared to the microscopes that we will use in this class. Unfortunately, the micro microscopes that we use in this class are not powerful enough to visualize viruses. We will not be able to see viruses under the microscope in this class. The last and perhaps most nightmarish category of microbes that we will be looking at in this class are the helminths. Helminths is synonymous with parasitic worms. This includes two major categories, the roundworms and the flatworms. Roundworms is synonymous with nematodes and flatworms is somewhat synonymous with tapeworms, but we'll get more into that later. Helminths are also sort of an interesting category to include in microbiology because they are actually considered multicellular animals and they're only microscopic during certain life stages. For example, when they lay eggs or when they are in their early developmental forms. However, because they are microscopic for at least some of their lives and because they are involved in a variety of human diseases, we do include helminths in our purview within this class. Now that we've had our review of the different types of microbes, it's time for another checkpoint. S. aureus is the bacterium that causes staph infections. And you can see a microscopy image of S. aureus here on the slide. I want you to tell me what shape does S. aureus exhibit out of the three major shapes that we reviewed when we discussed bacteria. And one more checkpoint for you here. Satellite data out of Italy indicate that there is a large amount of extremely salty liquid water located underground on Mars. If this water were to be inhabited by a type of microbe, which type of microbe would it likely be? And be as specific as possible when you're giving this answer. Lastly, I want you to put your new microbiology knowledge to the test by identifying a microbe with these characteristics. An unidentified unicellular microbe is found to contain a nucleus but lack a cell wall. It was isolated as a parasite from an infected person. What category of microbe does this belong to out of the six that we've just finished discussing? So in the final part of this lecture, we are going to take a look at a brief history of developments that have occurred in microbiology, sort of a highlights reel of major occurrences. Microbiology is a pretty young science. It took a long time for it to gain traction, and many of the major discoveries in microbiology centered around the study of diseases. But a lot of those discoveries weren't able to occur until after microscopes were invented. In antiquity, the causes of diseases were not well understood because without more advanced tools, it was impossible to distinguish between diseases that were caused by infectious agents, ones that were caused by environmental agents, or ones that were caused by genetics. Thus, in the absence of a better explanation, Diseases were usually attributed to supernatural forces. However, this does not mean that humans knew nothing of microbiology at this time. And in fact, there is a deep and rich history of traditional and indigenous knowledge related to microbiology. For example, people around the world have been creating fermented foods and beverages for thousands of years. And while the microscopic details of these fermentation processes were not well understood at the time, there was a very good understanding of how to perform fermentation and achieve the end result, whether it be alcoholic beverages, yogurt, pickled vegetables, or other food and beverage products. 
Indigenous peoples also used agricultural practices that harnessed beneficial microbes in the soil, such as certain bacteria that live symbiotically on the roots of beans and legumes, or fungi that increase the nutrient absorption in crops. And again, while the understanding of the underlying mechanism wasn't there, the understanding of the process and the outcome was, and this knowledge is still used today. There were also herbal medicines, some of which served as the source of medicines that we still derive drugs from today. So for example, sweet wormwood, which is the plant that you can see on the slide pictured here, was used for thousands of years in traditional Chinese medicine to treat malaria. And in 1972, Chinese scientist Tu Yuyu isolated the drug artemisinin from sweet wormwood, leading it to eventually become the standard treatment for malaria around the world still today. And she even received the Nobel Prize in Medicine for this discovery. So all of this to say that microbiology-related knowledge has been around far longer than Western medicine has and has a rich history. However, that knowledge was limited by the tools available, and therefore um, the absence of any knowledge that there might be microscopic living organisms behind all of these processes. One of the first documented instances of a paradigm shift in this area was with the teachings of Hippocrates, who was a Greek physician and also the man that the Hippocratic Oath is named after, who proposed that diseases were not caused by supernatural forces, as was the common school of thought at the time, but rather natural forces such as factors in the environment or factors in the person themselves. And by the way, just for your peace of mind, I don't expect you to know the dates on each of these occurrences. I only want you to know the highlights reel. Hippocrates lived from 460 to 370 BC, and it wasn't until 700, uh, several hundred years later that the Roman intellectual Marcus Terentius Varro wrote about the dangers of swamps and their ability to transmit minute creatures by way of the mouth or nose, which could then lead to serious diseases. So he was one of the first people to ever uh, suggest that there are living things in the world that we cannot see that cause diseases. However, this was merely a hypothesis at this time because in the absence of microscopes or other tools to visualize these living things, there was no way for him to confirm this idea. So now we're gonna take a massive leap forward about 1600 years into the future when the first microscopes began to be developed. Robert Hooke was not the first person to ever develop a microscope. But in 1665, he was the first person to ever develop a microscope that was powerful enough to observe small living organisms and the cells that organisms are composed of. In fact, he is the first person to coin the term cell, which we still use today to describe these fundamental units of living organisms. Later, Antoine van Leeuwenhoek in 1675 developed an even more powerful microscope that was used to observe microscopic organisms in rainwater, which he referred to as wee little beasties. At the same time, other scientists were working on the problem related to the hypothesis of spontaneous generation. Spontaneous generation was the idea that living organisms could emerge from nothingness. And Francesco Redi was one of the first people to disprove spontaneous generation in his covered jar experiment. Instead, Francesco Redi was providing support for an alternative hypothesis, and the hypothesis that lives on to this day, of biogenesis. Whereas spontaneous generation suggests that living organisms can be generated from non-living matter, Biogenesis, 
suggests that all living organisms are derived from other living organisms. So, for example, when you leave a piece of meat out in the open air, and after a few days maggots appear on the surface, common belief at the time dictated that those maggots were spontaneously generated. However, Francesco Reddy disproved this by arranging an experiment where he took a series of jars and divided them into multiple groups. In one group, he capped both of the jars with a piece of meat inside and demonstrated that in capping the jar, no maggots were able to colonize the meat. In another example, he took two jars and he put a piece of gauze on top, which was breathable, such that the scent of the meat could escape, but flies were not able to colonize the surface of the meat. What he observed in this experiment was that the flies were attracted to the meat and that maggots later appeared on the surface of the gauze, but not on the meat itself. In the third arrangement, he set up two open jars where flies would have access to the meat. And in this experiment, he noticed that the maggots appeared on the surface of the meat itself. So in his experiment, there was a suggestion that the maggots could not emerge spontaneously because the closed jar featured no maggots and the jar with the gauze on top only featured maggots on the surface of the gauze. However, his experiment did not definitively disprove spontaneous generation, and we'll talk about the other scientists who were involved in disproving this in just a moment. In 1765, Lazaro Spallanzani again disproved spontaneous generation with a different experiment. In this experiment, what he did was he took two sets of flasks containing a broth with nutrients in it. He boiled both of them, which we now know today has the effect of killing all of the microscopic organisms that might be inside. One of the flasks he capped, and the other he left open. And after a time, he noticed that one of the flasks, namely the one that was open, became contaminated with microscopic organisms, whereas the one that was capped did not. So again, this was further proof that microscopic organisms and growth cannot arise spontaneously on its own. It has to come from somewhere. However, even after Spallanzani's experiment, there was the objection that maybe the air itself held some sort of vital force that was needed for the spontaneous generation of life, and that by putting the stopper in the flasks, he had prevented this vital force from entering. That objection was finally answered by Louis Pasteur, namesake of the process known as pasteurization, in 1861, who finally and definitively put the nail in the coffin of the spontaneous generation hypothesis with his swan-necked flask experiment. What Louis Pasteur did in this experiment is he created these specially designed swan-necked flasks named for the fact that they have a crook in their neck, much like a swan. And like Spallanzani, he took a, a sample of broth and he boiled it to rid it of any contaminating microorganisms. And the curve in the neck of the flask allowed for air to be exchanged with the outside environment. However, any microscopic organisms that were carried in the air would get trapped in the U-bend of the swan neck and never were able to reach the broth. So in this way, he was able to create a situation where air exchange was still possible, but the microbes could not be carried in that air because of the U-bend. This demonstrated definitively that there was not a vital force in the air itself that was allowing for spontaneous generation to occur. And in fact, in one of the experiments, when he broke off the top of the flask, he demonstrated that the broth would become contaminated. So 
Louis Pasteur definitively disproved spontaneous generation in favor of biogenesis, which we know to be true today. Now, at the same time that scientists were working on distinguishing between spontaneous generation and biogenesis, other scientists were working on what's called the germ theory of disease. The germ theory of disease suggests that some diseases are caused by infectious microorganisms. And at the time, of course, this was not well understood. It was known that microscopic organisms were in existence, but it was not known how they were related to disease. Ignash Semmelweis was a Hungarian medical student who uh, was able to advance the germ theory of disease through hand washing practices. What he observed was that uh, there, were, there was a very high rate of post-birth infections, um, perinatal sepsis among women who had just given birth. And he noted that physicians at the time where he worked would go from performing an autopsy straight to delivering a child without washing their hands. So he hypothesized that there was a transmission of disease from the microscopic organisms on the corpse to the women giving birth and suggested that a hand washing practice could eliminate this transmission. This suggestion was furthered by Joseph Lister, who was a physician who implemented an early version of what we now call aseptic technique. Joseph Lister was a surgeon who is today referred to as the father of modern surgery, who insisted on extreme cleanliness in the surgical suite at a time when 50% of post-surgical patients were dying from infections that would emerge after the surgery. Dr. Lister's insistence on cleaning hands, cleaning tools, uh, and preventing infection was able to dramatically increase the success rate of operations um, at this time when operations were really not very successful due to the post-op infection rate. Not long after this, a scientist named Robert Koch was able, for the first time, to connect a specific species of microbe to a specific disease, which had never been done before up until this point. He was able to say that this bacterium, Bacillus anthracis, is the cause of this disease, anthrax. And he did this by isolating it from the blood of cattle that were affected by anthrax. What he found was that all cattle infected with this disease had the presence of this microbe in their blood. This led him to hypothesize a series of postulates that are now known as Koch's postulates. And this was the foundation for our understanding of how species of microbes can go on to cause specific diseases. Thankfully, not long after that was the first discovery of the ability to treat bacterial infections through antibiotics. In 1928, Alexander Fleming serendipitously discovered that the mold in the genus Penicillium has antimicrobial properties. As you can see on this Petri dish right here. These streaks right here are bacterial growth, and this fuzzy little white spot is penicillium mold. You may see that there is a halo around the outside of the penicillium mold where the bacteria are not growing. And that's because as a defense mechanism for itself, this mold produces and secretes the substance that we now recognize as the antibiotic penicillin. After this discovery, this led to the first ability to treat bacterial infections uh, that had ever been known before. And since then, we've had a flood of other antibiotics be discovered, so much so um, that their use over the past hundred years 
now threatens the ability of antibiotics to remain effective because bacteria are evolving to become resistant to them. This is another topic that we'll talk about more later. So today, our picture of microbiology is far more advanced than it was just a few hundred years ago. Today we have aseptic technique for maintaining a sterile environment. We have rules about food handling and sterilization so as not to transmit diseases. We have vaccines that prevent infectious diseases by harnessing our natural immune system responses. We have antibiotics, antiviral, and antifungal drugs, and emerging levels of resistance to these drugs. And we have microbial biologics, or in other words, medicines, that are produced by and derived from microscopic organisms, such as insulin. When we look at the past hundred years um, and put this in perspective, there has never been a better time to be alive in terms of our ability to treat, prevent, uh, and otherwise uh, fight infectious diseases. And in just a moment, I'm going to tell you about three really recent and really exciting developments in the field of microbiology. But before we do that, we have one last checkpoint. And in that checkpoint, I want you to name one individual who contributed to the germ theory of disease and tell me how they did it. Now, lastly, in this lecture, I want to get everyone excited about microbiology and show you that this is not a field that is stagnant. This is a field that is developing new advancements all the time and really exciting advancements. One of those really exciting advancements is a malaria vaccine that is undergoing trials. The trials have shown that it is up to 77% effective in young children, which is a huge deal because 3,000 children die every day from malaria infections. It is a major public health problem in parts of the developing world and is considered a pandemic because there are literally hundreds of millions of people who have malaria today on the planet. So the malaria vaccine trials are a really exciting advancement in fighting this protozoan parasite that we've already mentioned a few times in this lecture. Here's another cool thing that's happening in microbiology. Bacteria as medicine. There's a company out there called Synlogic that is developing genetically engineered bacteria that are meant to be used as probiotics for treating certain diseases. An example is phenylketonuria, which is a genetic disease wherein a person cannot break down the amino acid phenylalanine, which is a component of proteins. The resulting lack of breakdown uh, creates toxicity, which can lead to severe intellectual disability. So babies are screened for phenylketonuria when they are born, and if they are found to be affected by this disease, they need to be identified immediately and have to eat an extremely restrictive diet for their entire lives to avoid consuming this amino acid. But this company, Synlogic, has designed a special genetically engineered bacterium that is able to consume the amino acid phenylalanine with the hope that people could take this bacterium as a probiotic, add it to your own gut microbiome, and therefore people affected by this disease might not have to live with the restrictions that they do today. So bacteria as medicine, a really exciting concept. And lastly here, we have viruses as medicine. Not all viruses are bad. In fact, not all viruses even infect humans at all. There are viruses that infect bacterial cells and use those as their hosts for their parasitic processes. These viruses can actually be beneficial to humans because of their ability to fight and kill bacteria. And there are advancements currently being made in harnessing these types of bacteria infecting viruses as an alternative antibiotic therapy for killing infections that are highly resistant to our current antibiotics. I have linked a video here 
which talks about the use of these viruses, or in other words, phages, as they are called, in treating some very resistant infections occurring in people who have the genetic disease cystic fibrosis. I highly recommend you watch this video. It's very cool. You can walk through um, the case of, of a girl who has cystic fibrosis and see how these phages have been used to treat her infections. Uh, very exciting stuff. So I hope this leaves you excited about microbiology and everything that we have to learn in this class. And I look forward to seeing you in the next lecture.